Good morning. This week is also the teenagers, right? I don't know if that was mentioned, but uh, 10 o'clock on Tuesday, teenagers will be gathering in the family worship building, and so uh, come on out for that. Uh, there'll be some, some bingo, some games, some food, uh, some time and fellowship. I know that you'll enjoy that. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to James chapter 3. James 3, where we continue what we have been learning over these last several weeks. I hope today that in God's Word you'll find some encouragement. So if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word. James 3, we'll begin at verse 13, read through verse 18. James says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. And we know, Lord, that it is by the power of Your Word, applied by Your Spirit, that we are transformed, changed to be more like our Savior Jesus Christ. And this passage today tells us, Lord, about wisdom from above, and each person here wants to be wise. So God, would you please bless us with understanding, guide our hearts to love what you love, to desire to bring glory to our Savior Jesus Christ in everything that we do, that all of life would be an act of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to start you in some ways in a, in a different place in Scripture today and eventually get back around to where we are in the book of James. I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 3. And many of you all will probably know the story of how Solomon began his time as king of Israel. David has died at this point. Solomon has been appointed to the throne. And he is a young man. And he knows that he is inexperienced. And he's a man in need. He needs guidance on how to lead the people of Israel. And so after he had worshipped one night, he was asleep. God came to him in a dream. And the Lord asked Solomon, he said, what is it that you would want? Just tell me what it is that you would have, whatever it is, and I will give it to you. Essentially giving Solomon a blank check. What do you want? As the new king of Israel, I'll grant it. And I want to tell you some of what Solomon says. I'm going to read to you what Solomon says to the Lord and then the Lord's response to Solomon. This is what he says. O Lord my God, You have made Your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? And so Solomon says, I'm not able. I'm like a little child. I don't know how to do this. Just because I've been appointed to be the king does not mean that I am fully equipped to handle the job that you have given to me. So he says, please give me a wise and understanding mind. I need that more than anything else. And this is God's response to Solomon. He says, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, 
I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. What a wonderful thing there. It tells us what God's heart was toward Solomon when he asked it. It says it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord that he had asked for this thing. He could have asked for anything. Lord, make me wealthy, make me prominent, make me honored among the people so that they'll respect me like they did my father David. Make me a great warrior king if need be. If there are enemies about me, let me conquer them so that everybody would appreciate me. That's not what he asked at all. It pleased the Lord because Solomon asked for something that was not self-serving. He wasn't looking to promote himself, puff himself up. It came from a spirit of humility to serve other people and to care for them. He wanted to be a good king. He wanted to be a king that would please the Lord, to do what honored God. He wanted to be a king that brought glory to his God in the way that he governed the people. God made this world to function in a particular way. And bringing glory to Him is at the center of the world's purpose. It's why He made everything. It gets down to the root of why this world is here. Why are sunrises beautiful? Why are trees majestic? Why are our bodies so intricately woven and in such a way that we heal ourselves? Our bodies heal. They reproduce themselves. Why is that? To bring glory to God. All of it. And so why is it that we are here for the same purpose? And we need wisdom to know how to fulfill our purpose in the various compartments of life. Every situation that we find ourselves in, we want to glorify God. At least that should be our intent. It should be what we want to do in everything. Whether you're a king ruling over many people, or a mom who stays at home and takes care of her children, or you're a farmer that's out in your fields managing your herds, or maybe your chickens. Whatever it is, you want to be a man or woman who is wise and brings glory to God in everything that you do. That's our purpose. And we need wisdom from above, from God, to fulfill it. And wisdom is not just applied knowledge. It's not just knowing how to be happy in the world. And there are plenty of people, are there not, who reject the Lord, who might be called wise by their friends in this world, and they do have some broken fragments of wisdom. They've got some practical advice to give. But they miss the aim of what true wisdom actually is, what its purpose is. And so in every compartment of life, the truly wise man or woman will want to live skillfully for the glory of God. Every decision, every step you take, every conversation you have, every thought you want to be captive to do this very thing. Honor the Lord. Please Him. How do I do that, Lord? I cannot do this on my own unless You grant me wisdom. We want God to be made much of, to be pleased, to be shown great. Not made great, He is great. And how can my life and how I live demonstrate that? That's what it means to glorify God. And so the only way that we can do that is like Solomon, to humbly ask God to grant us the wisdom that we need. It does not come from anywhere else but from Him. And so in Proverbs 2, that same Solomon writes, For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. It's there, all of it, everything that we need in His storehouse, ready to be distributed. But will we ask? 
And so naturally, when we get to the book of James, what does he say there at the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 5? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. James is a wise man. And he knows where wisdom comes from. It comes directly from the Lord. So he says, ask. Just like Solomon did, God delighted in that, granted it to him. He says, ask and God will give you wisdom. And so all of that is helpful background for the question that James asks the church in chapter 3, verse 13. What does he ask? Who is wise and understanding among you? Who among you thinks that you are wise? Who among you are truly living out the purpose for which you were made? And then he answers himself. He says, if you are really wise, it will prove itself by the way that you live your life in community with other people. If you are wise, it will show itself. It cannot help it. Whatever wisdom that you have will come out in the way that you live. It's just the way that it works. So if you are wise, given by God, it will prove itself by the way that you live in relationship with other people. And that James says this should not surprise us in any way. He's already shown us that he's concerned that our fruit will match our confession. That just saying that you're something is not good enough. And so if he were to ask the question, who among you is wise? Who among you is discerning and understanding? And somebody raises their hand and says, I am. He says, show me. Show me by the way that you live. So he's told us already that hearing will lead to doing. Faith should always lead to good works. And if you are wise, it will come out and show itself by what he says in verse 13, your good conduct. It will show itself by the way that you live. and It will be good, good judged by the Lord. Not just called good by mankind, but God will say that is good. And what he proceeds to do here is describe the difference between two kinds of wisdom that a person in this world might have. That there's only two kinds of wisdom to be had. One is the wisdom that comes down from above. He calls it that in verses 15 and 17. And from above, we know that he means from heaven, that the source of this wisdom is God Himself. And he describes the other kind of wisdom in verses 14 To 16, look there with me again. This is what he describes that kind of wisdom to be. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth, saying that you have wisdom. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And so he tells us that one kind of wisdom that is out there is from above. It is given by God. And then there is another kind of wisdom that is present in our world. It is devised by demons and taught by men. This earthly, unspiritual wisdom, what does it do? It excludes God. It leaves Him out seeks to explain the world that He made without Him. It only takes into account the natural world. What a person wants to believe about himself, whatever makes him feel best. And so this worldly wisdom does not even acknowledge the Creator and any purpose that He has made His people to live by. Nothing is said about Him. Nothing to say about His glory not seeking to make much of God in any compartment of life. The self is its own authority. The individual is supreme. And if you're paying attention out in the world, you know that this kind of wisdom is spread everywhere. It's in modern education. Anytime you turn the TV on to the news media, 
Have you ever heard them truly talking about the Lord and what He wants? So therefore, in politics, is God actually mentioned except to try to gather a couple of votes at the, maybe the mention of His name? But if you've watched those debates on television, is anything ever asked like, what do you think the Lord would say about this? What most honors God in this particular situation? Nope, nobody cares about that. What do you think? What's your policy? What's your party say about that? Nobody cares about the Lord. If you know anything about pop culture, the same way, it's all about the self. What's put on your television screens or people running that through the filter of what honors God, what brings glory to Him? Not one bit. It's just the air that we breathe. It's everywhere out there. Earthly wisdom wants you to live without reference at all to God. You can do this without Him. It's all about what you want. So the wisdom of sinful man, the wisdom of demons, has been sown all over creation to squeeze the name of God out of the fabric of the world that He made. It's astounding. It's blasphemous. And if we think that this is just prevalent in the 21st century, we are wrong. It's the way it has always been in the hearts of sinful man. So that Paul would write to the church at Rome in the first century, this is what he says. He says, claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So man likes to say that he is wise. Look at me, this is wisdom. And what's he done? He has exchanged a love for the glory of God for a love of the glory of man. And he'll make representations of this false god, either in himself or with images of creeping things and birds and reptiles and whatever else. Anything but God is what's being said. I'll take anything, anything to worship but Him. He will not have authority over me. I will give glory to myself and anything else in creation that I find, but not Him. That's the heart of the wisdom of man. And so the world does. It boasts about how wise it is, how tolerant, how loving, how orderly and and reasonable it is. But as Paul says here, their wisdom is the stuff of fools. It's like the emperor who had no clothes. We should be able to see it and recognize it. Just because somebody says it does not mean that it is so. And the proof is in what they produce with their wisdom, disorder and every vile practice, James says. So you want to see their wisdom? Look what it produces. Chaos. Vileness. Ungodliness. Sin abounds everywhere if you follow what they teach. And this kind of man-centered wisdom should never creep its way into the church of Jesus Christ. This is the place where God's glory has been revealed to us. It's been seen. We've been captivated by it. We've beheld His glory in His Word and in our hearts by faith. But James says that this, as sad as it is, it's possible. It's possible that the wisdom of the earth, the wisdom of demons, can make, can make its way into the church And the way that you can identify it is by its fruit. The fruit of self finds its way into the church. And he names specifically in bitter envy and selfish ambition. It means that when I look around because I think of myself as being primary, I'm constantly comparing myself to other people. And when I see that things are going better for you, I'm likely to kind of say, man, I don't like that person. Or I wish that maybe they'd be knocked down a peg or two. Constantly comparing myself. Selfish ambition. Wanting more for me in comparison to you. What specifically might that look like in the church? 
suspicion, mistrust, judgmentalism, gossip, wanting to be recognized, wanting to be thought more spiritual than other people, angry even when people listen to you but they don't listen to me. Always having a complaint because something is not the way that you want it. I don't like that. So James gets to the heart of this wisdom from below. It is quick to insert self into every detail. What I want, what seems best to me, rather than asking the question, what is best and what does God want? It's what do I want? And what does it do? It destroys unity. It fosters division and ungodliness. And so James calls it here earthly wisdom. But it's just another name for sin, isn't it? And we're all sinners here. We know the effects of sin. And sin always seems right in the moment. It always seems reasonable. We might even call it wise. But our book of wisdom says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So it seems right to us, and sin does seem right to us, but sin leads to death. That's what happened when it entered into the world, and that's what it leads to in our own lives too. It leads to destruction. When have you ever seen sin produce something good? When has sin brought peace and rest and joy? That is not in its nature. It just does not do those things. So it is with foolishness. Sin appeals to the senses. It appeals to our emotions. It makes us feel good in the moment. But there's a hook inside the bait. And it will destroy us. And it's one thing for us to see that and identify it out there in the politics that we're watching, to see it in Hollywood and know what what it is. On social media, there's plenty of it. Or maybe even in some distant church out there, you find out that chaos, disorder has happened in that church. You hear about it. But our purpose this morning is to make sure that this kind of wisdom is not operating in us. Right here. And maybe even just a little bit closer than that, let's make certain that it's not operating in me. Because we probably can all think of somebody, can we not? Like, I know somebody like that. But God wants us to apply the word to our own hearts. And so let's look at that question Are we wise? Are we understanding? Or are we operating by earthly wisdom? We've all seen too many pictures this week, I'm sure, videos of what's left behind after a terrible storm comes through. Shocking, even. Are you something like a storm? And too many of your relationships show that you have been there. You've crossed through and there is an aftermath of your presence in that relationship with your winds and your rain and your hail and your lightning. And I'm sure in the moment and one of those circumstances, what you said or did seemed right. It seemed good at the time. But afterwards, all it left was destruction. And hopefully now that you've come through on the other side of that, you've seen what you've done, you've loved the wisdom of Jesus Christ, you want to live skillfully to the glory of God, and so you've repented. You've asked for forgiveness. You've used your mouth instead of for destruction. You've used your mouth for peace and healing. I hope that that's the case. I hope you've learned from that and love the way of Jesus. 
But far too often, the people who continually wreak havoc in the lives of other people, they take no accountability, they refuse correction, and they always play the victim. It's always somebody else's fault. It's because self has to be the winner. It refuses to back down. It refuses to admit fault in any way. It refuses to lose because it seems like repentance or asking for forgiveness is losing. And self will not have that. It plays second fiddle to no one. That is earthly wisdom. That's just in its nature. That's how it operates. But then James tells us about a wisdom from above. This kind of wisdom comes down into the soul of man directly from God. The man who wants this kind of wisdom, he will be humble, receptive to instruction, like Solomon admits his limitations, knows that he does not have everything that he needs, and he's willing to ask I heard a, something that this week, it was going through one of the Psalms, and, uh, and simply the application was, Lord, help. It's just help. How many of you all have offered uh, prayers like that to God before? It's like, that's just all you've got, help. And that means, like, Lord, please give me what I do not have. I need wisdom. Help. That's the type of person that will be asking for wisdom from above. This is the the kind of woman who knows that she would mess things up on her own. And what does she do? She calls out to God. So here in James, the wisdom that he's talking about is the summary. It is the summary of what the Christian needs for faithful living. It's the answer for everything that we need. We need wisdom to be able to live and do and act and speak and decide and work and parent, and be a husband or wife to the glory of God. How do I do that? Lord, help me. Please give me what I need. And in Paul's letters, he says it in a different way. He talks about the Spirit and he talks about the flesh. But it seems with James that the concept that he's operating out of here is wisdom and foolishness. Same concept, different terminology. And so, God, please give me your wisdom is the same as, God, please lead me by your Spirit. Don't let me follow my flesh. Because I know that's where I'm prone to go. If left to myself, I will destroy me and I will destroy other people. God, give me wisdom to do this in a way that honors and pleases you. And so wisdom, when it's given, when it's there, when it's present, will create communities that reflect the heart of heaven, the place from above where it comes from. Homes will be well-ordered. Friendships, instead of destroyed, will be maintained. Marriages, instead of being broken, will be healed. Children will honor their parents And when church members come together to serve, they'll do it together with joy. Why? Because nobody who comes there cares anything about getting the credit or the pat on the back or the applause. Everybody who comes together to serve knows that it's being done for the credit, the applause of Jesus Christ. That's the aim. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to You be the glory. That's the heart of wisdom. And so if we are wise people, it will be reflected wherever we go and with whomever we run into, whoever you come into contact with. It's as if the aroma of Jesus Christ is following in your wake. And so if peace can be had, you will have it. If it can be maintained, it will be maintained as far as depends on you. Now, you can't control everybody else and how they respond, but if it's up to you, peace will be had. And so like he says here about sowing peace, everywhere you go, you're sowing peace. And all of these relationships, you want healing and reconciliation to take place. You don't want bitterness and anger maintained. That doesn't honor God. 
That doesn't fulfill my purpose here on earth as a representative of Jesus. No, peace comes from me. This is how James describes that wisdom from above. Starting at verse 17, he says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So again, the question, who here is wise? Who's wise? Because this right here is what a wise life looks like. And we should not care one bit what the wisdom of the world is out there saying. We don't live like that. That's not what matters to us. This right here is the good life. This is what it means to live skillfully to make much of Him. I want to live and be wise. We were back at the first chapter there at verse 5 when we were going through this and I was sitting down in my office and the thought occurred to me, if I could have one thing, one thing, I want wisdom. Because wisdom entails all of life. Every decision, how I operate, the grid by which I do everything, I want to be wise. My wife needs a wise husband. Her husband needs a wise wife. I want wise children. And they need to learn it from me. A wise dad. That they've been put here on earth for one purpose, and it's to bring glory to God. And that is the way to the most joy, by the way. There's more joy to be had there than the wisdom of the world. It's not fleeting. It lasts forever. I can remember having a conversation with um, one of my older daughters several years ago. She's 15 or 16, somewhere around there. And I know what the world is telling her. And you know what the world is telling your kids. It's like they exist to be a good producer and to have a good job and to have a nice career and make lots of money and to be comfortable and secure and all of those things. That's what they're being told. That's what they're being prepped for constantly at school. What's the aim of their education? So they can go to college, get a good job, and live the good life. And my daughter went to a very good school that told her things like that. And I was up in her room one night and I told her, I said, if you could have this or this, this being you have a really good career, you make lots of money, you're very successful, the whole world tells you how well you have done, but you don't know Jesus, and you're not living for Him, or you could leave home, go to the other side of the world, I would never see you again, you live in a mud hut, barefooted, got nothing, but you've got Christ and you're living for His glory, I want you to take number two. That's wisdom. That's the good life. But boy, that don't look good to most people. But to the child of God who has received instruction from above, you know that that is the good life. It will last forever and ever and ever. That is wise. And not only will it serve your joy, it will serve the joy of so many other people. That's what I want her to have. That's what I still want her to have. And so the beginning and the end for us when it comes to wisdom is ultimately found in a person. Jesus Christ is the gateway to us for all the wisdom of God. It's all found in Him. He is wisdom personified. 
He is the storehouse of God's wisdom that we have access to. It's why we can have wisdom from above. Jesus brings that to us. He gives it to us by His Spirit in the moment when we ask. And so Paul would tell the church in Colossae that his prayer for them is that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance, of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Like Jesus is a treasure chest of God's wisdom. When you know Him, you will be wise. You will delight to be wise. So ask and know that God the Father delights to give His children good things like wisdom to be able to live skillfully in every way to His glory. That's your purpose. And collectively, that is this church's purpose. It's why we are here together. God delights that when His church will demonstrate His wisdom to a watching world, God forbid that we would ever stain His name together as a church or individually of it. No, we are to show how wise our God is as we have relationships with other people. So primarily here, I think relationships, but it's also in your finances and how you spend your time and what you watch on the television. Everything, everything of life needs wisdom. So I ask again as we close, Who among us is truly wise? And my hope is that today, is as we finish, there's not going to be music playing. We're going to just close in prayer. My hope is that God would use His Word and God would use a few minutes of silence for us to bring our life before Him for examination and to say, Lord, where in my life am I not being wise? Where am I living foolishly, self-centered for myself, for my own glory and not Yours? And this would be a moment to respond in faith by repenting. Repenting of sin. Remember, this is wise to repent. We don't war with God on that. He knows what's best. His Word knows what's best. Respond to it. And maybe this morning you've come into this place and you know that you have been operating your whole life out of the wisdom of the world. It's all about what makes me happy. What I think is best. God says what you need more than anything else is His Son. You need first, you need to know the wisdom of God in Jesus Christ. That you are a sinner and God saves sinners like you. And He does it through His Son who willingly, joyfully offered up Himself on a cross and the wrath of God, the judgment of God was poured out on Him so that it would not need to be poured out on you. He was willing to take your place. And in Him is wisdom for a life lived skillfully for the glory of God. You can now live for Jesus Christ. This morning, if that's you... As we pause for a moment, ask God for mercy and salvation. That He would grant it for you with cleansing and forgiveness. So I'm going to pray for us and whatever the response needs to be, no doubt it is, Lord, please give me what I need. I am not able on my own, but You are. You are fully able. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for wisdom from above. We have been discipled by the world. We are constantly being discipled by the world to think, to process, to educate, to parent, to love as the world does. And Father, we need Your Word this morning to strike through all the mess and show us what true wisdom from You looks like so that we will live in a way that honors our God. I want to live as a wise man this week, and I know the people who are here today also want to live with wisdom. Will You please show us the way? 
And so as much as anything, we need to draw near to Jesus Christ who will grant us wisdom and peace and love from above. And we will carry that over into the relationships that You have given us in this world. God help us. On our own, we are lost and we'll destroy things, ourselves and others. But with You, there will be healing and hope and rest and peace and joy. So Father, we ask collectively, would You please grant this church, this congregation, wisdom. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. So just a couple of minutes.